My guest today is truly a global thought leader in the employer branding space. Before falling in love with the art and craft of employer brand, he was a digital marketing expert for 15 plus years before moving into EB. Since moving into the employer branding space, he's taken his skills uh, to be the leading voice and practitioner in the employer branding space globally. He's the author of two books, uh, Employer Branding Handbook and uh, Employer Brand Talent Chooses You. In his career, he's worked for some incredible iconic brands, which include Groupon, Disney, and Target, to name a a few. We are very excited to have James Ellis, the global authority on employer brand, join us today. James, welcome to Talent Blazers. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I cannot live up to an intro like that. Come on. What are you doing to me? That's insane. That's nuts. That's funny because you wrote it yourself. Ah, uh, don't sh- don't tell them all. <laughs> don't tell them. That's the secrets. That's the sausage getting made. Come on, be a buddy. <laughs> well, James, thanks for joining us. I really do appreciate it. Oh no, thrilled um, to be here. Um, yeah, I'd really be interested to know what you're up to uh, at the moment. What are you working on, or what are you planning to do in the future? You know, um, I'm working the day job. I got that the day job is the day job, and I don't want to get into that too much. Um, the newsletter has been kind of going really well. It's been almost two years now. It's gotten 1,700 subscribers, which I, I couldn't wow. name seven. Right, right. It's like how many employer branders are there in the universe? And apparently there's at least 1,700 of them. And apparently some of them like to talk to me or hear what I have to say, which is nuts. Uh, the, the, and, and to kind of just sneak preview, there is a t- conversation in the works of bringing the podcast back. Slightly different format, but... I'm going to be a little more tight-lipped around that until things are kind of nailed you down. Totally do that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's all things employer brand in my world. It's just that's all. The reason I have no hair is because all that's left is employer brand. Well, the book, uh, Talent Chooses You, that was a good one. You got any any other books on the way? Nothing right now. Uh, I think the it's funny. The Talent Chooses You was was – designed to be this thing that said, look, I'm just kind of sick of having the same conversations over and over again. Like what should you do for Glassdoor? And what should you do for, you know, the same stuff that you see over and people walking in because there's no kind of school. There's no entry level of just, here's what the basics are and what you do. And there's some really good books out there by other people, Richard Mosley, you know, to name one. Uh, I've just kind of talked about what is the theoretical, what is the process? What does it look like a little bit? But getting down the nitty gritty we keep having the same conversations over and over again. I was like, well, you know, if I could just bake that into a simple kind of document, like, hey, everybody, here's the 20 things we all already decided. We've already figured this part out there. Now what's next? And so that's really what the book was. And so I wrote it about mm. three years ago, which is crazy because it feels like I, you know, I've been writing it forever. Um, I did it in six weeks. Most of it just kind of going, I'm bored. Wow. I need to do it. And so, I'm giving it away. If you go to employerbrandbook.com, it's not like a, a, a sweepstakes or anything. Literally, you get to see the, the Google Doc of the text. It's right there. You can even, if you feel inclined, you can go in and comment on it and talk about it and kind of point at it and say, James, you're wrong. And I'm like, that's great. Cool. Fantastic. Um, so it's really kind of an open source book to say, look, if you're walking into employer brand, whether it's from marketing or recruiting or someplace else, and you kind of go, I only kind of know, like, I feel like I I get half of it. Here's the book. Here's, let's stop having the old conversations. Let's start having new discussions to really elevate the industry. Not that I think I'm going to elevate the industry, but at least if I can document the old stuff, maybe it opens the door for the new. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the future. Let's, let's, uh, big swinging question right from the start. What does the future of employer branding look like? If you fast forward in the next three years, I'm fascinated to get your opinion on this. Yeah. So for my two cents and for exactly what that's worth, you know, we had the last 30 years as employer brands saying, I'm going to take all the lessons from product branding for lack, you know, that that, it's fish sticks, right? You understand the product, you understand the audience, you put one in front of the other, you figure out the right price, you figure out your channels, you optimize and metric, boom, 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 Bob's your uncle, kabam, you go off, you know, there you go. And in the last five years, we started to say, there's more, there's something else going on here that you can't strictly apply standard brand practices to employer brand because we live in a world of quality, not quantity. We don't want more applicants. We want better applicants. And by the way, ours is the only industry that actually thinks that way. We are legitimately, no joke, unique in that regard. So that means all the stuff that we've been stealing from 
isn't designed to fit us. It's designed for more, not better. And so we have to figure out how to refactor that. But the next big kind of shift, if you play that out, is to say, okay, what is employer branding trying to create? What is the world that it wants to invent? And I think it's a world in which recruiting isn't about finding 100 resumes. It's not about encouraging 50 applications. It's about creating honesty, if you can believe it. Yes, marketing can create honesty. Here, he said it first here. Absolutely. It's true. Um, where you get to say, as a company or as a team or as a location or bake your microculture however you see fit, this is what the work, this is what we promise the work experience is going to be like. This is what we stand for. This is what we reward. This is what we are motivated by. And these are the kinds of people we think should be part of what we have to do. Now, that kind of honesty is a bit of a game changer because you look at what we have now, which is positive, positive, positive. We're a great place to work. We're the best place to work. We're a fantastic place to work. Yay! And it's yeah. all Jiminy yeah. Cricket kind of going, yay, we're fantastic. Yeah. And it's like, no, you can't all be the best place to work. That's literally impossible, but best place to work for whom? In what way? For what kind of person? For what kind of role? For what kind of mentality? For what kind of mindset? It's the, the, the phrase best place to work or great place to work is half a sentence. It's not completing the thought and that's cheating. That's just cheating. So the future of employer brand is saying is completing that thought. If we're a great place to work, for whom are we a great place to work and in which, what way are we? And when you're that honest, the magic is candidates are forced to be honest too. If you say, look, we're a great place to work because we, we run fast, we move fast and break things, not to give them any press, thank you very much. Um, you know, we do these things and because of that, we tend to be kind of crazy. It tends to be very chaotic. People who like structure are not gonna be happy here. Does that sound like a horrible place to work? No, but for the person who likes the move fast and break things mentality, that sounds great, but that kind of, hey, these are the kinds of people who aren't gonna like it. That negative, if that's even the right word there, actually proves all the positive claims you're making. If I say, meet my friend Bob, he's really smart, he's really nice, he's attractive, he makes a lot of money, he's good to dogs, he loves his mother, you know, blah, 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 he gives money to charity, you're going, what's the catch with Bob? Bob racist? Yeah, what are we doing sure. here? What's going on? There's something wrong here, <laughs> because there's something, because you've said too many positive things for Bob to be totally cool, you're selling me something. And by the way, that's kind of how we to sell jobs. What you need to do is say, Bob is great, but by the way, Bob is, I don't know, he's got one eye. I don't know, he's something. You know, he, he, there's something wrong with him. You've got to give that one negative thing that mm. proves all the positive things. So when you do that, the candidate is forced to say, oh, it's like that? I want that. Oh, it's like mm. that? I don't want that. And so instead of people just blindly hitting apply as fast as they humanly possibly can, you're saying, oh, okay, now I have to consider. And what you're doing is shifting from a world of how do I – dragnet the ocean of applicants to just lift them up like mackerel out of the sea and you know by the billions instead it's about look there's only two or three people i want to talk to who are they and how do i make them go yeah i get it i want to be a part of this thing i want to be a piece of this thing i know how to add value to this thing and let's figure it out that's where employer branding is kind of pushing us all because it's creating that specificity of experience, specificity of the job, the microculture, and it's creating desire amongst the right people. Mm. It's, uh, it's, it is a fascinating conversation. As you were talking, I was thinking about um, the, the importance of, of marketing segmentation. I'm assuming that you're sort of pushing down that path as well. I think it's beyond that. I mean, I think there's a great example of, um, I want you to meet two people. They were both born in mm. 1948. They both uh, remember, they're both Brit Brits. They're both uh, raised through Britain, kind of figuring out how to crawl their way out of post-war world. Uh, they both were born up class. They both are well-known people, but one's Ozzy Osbourne and one's Prince Charles. So tell me about your demographics and how somehow you've put those two radically different people in the same box. So to me, market segmentation, we do a pretty bad job of it when we just go demographics yeah. or you know, put these little boxes. It's really about what kind of person, what is the mentality? What is the motivation? What do they want to be rewarded by? What do they respond to? What is the kind of culture? And it's not a demographic thing. It's, I mean, it's beyond psychographics, really. It's about you're the kind of person who wakes up and goes, how do I change the world? There's a company that says, yeah, that's exactly the kind of person I want. And then there are people who wake up and say, how do I optimize this so I never have to do this thing again? And there's a company that goes, yeah, 
Of course I want that thing. And those two things are so different as to be barely be in the same universe, let alone in the same company. If you don't define that, everything else is kind of talking about it. You got, yeah, I guess you got to get 100 applicants because hopefully one will be the kind of person you want mm. because you haven't spelled out what you actually want. All right. Awesome. Well, bringing us back to today, um, why is employer branding so valuable in a market like this? And um, I'll, I'll just add a little bit more to, to the question. We were just talking a little bit offline and how hard it is to find a very good employer branding person. They're like the new unicorns of our industry. People were looking a few years ago for data scientists. Well, today it's employer branding market in a world uh, that is the great resignation era. Yep. or you know, in a candidate short market. I'd love to get your perspective on this. Yeah, and honestly, I think it's all of TA. If you're a sorcerer or you're a good recruiter, you are as valuable a unicorn as any soft, full stack software engineer or machine learning expert was you know, three years ago. In fact, there's actually more demand for recruiters now than there are for engineers, if you can believe it. Look, the, the game got flipped. Somebody said it really, really well. He goes, you know how you're trying to look for talent and, and a long time ago you were making the talent dance for you? Guess what? Power flipped. And and it's not about them anymore. It's about you. What do you offer? What do you provide? What are the things that matter to you? And that's creating that match. And I think that's the big change that employer brand is manifesting. It's saying, and I bring it back to this idea, not to get completely abstract here, but what a company offers are two different things, subjective value and objective value. Objective value is What's the salary? What's the title? What's the start date? What's the leveling? What's the bonus structure? When do you have reviews? It is literally everything you'd find in the offer letter, right? And that is an objective, that is a value. If you say, I'm going to pay this person $80,000 and you they show up and you pay them $75,000, it's not about, oh, we had a different understanding of what $85,000 meant. It means someone's committed capital felony fraud and should be going to jail. That's objective, right? The trick is, though, we don't care about that as much as we think we do. What we care about is the subjective value, right? How much independence do I have? How much autonomy do I have? How much responsibility do I have? How much support do I have? How much structure do I have? How much freedom? How much status? How much all these subjective things, which if you look at job, career sites, and all that stuff, all these companies claim, oh, yeah, we're great. We love to offer freedom and autonomy and status and yada, 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 yada. But those things are subjective, which means what I think of as autonomy is way too autonomous for someone like you who might say we offer autonomy. So we say these buzzwords like independence and autonomy and innovation and whatever, and we leave it at that. We slap the word innovation somewhere on a career site. We say, check the box. We've called ourselves innovative. Done. Mm. Except I just applied mm. for your job on your weak ass ATS. And guess what? Innovation is not word that comes to mind. Anyway, so when you say innovative, what do you mean? To whom? In what way? In what capacity? To what edge? To what boundary? You've made a claim and then shut up. And that was wrong because subjective values need to be proved, I don't know, 10 times harder than an objective value. So the reason why recruiters lament and, and hire managers lament, why are we always talking about salary? Is because in the entirety of the entire interview process, there's only one data point that anybody on both sides of the table can believe in, and that is the salary, because it is objectively true. Everything else is a sales job. Everything else is a spin job. And if I can't believe that stuff, the only thing I have left to believe in is, well, I better max out on my salary because that's the only thing I can believe in. Teachers, Nonprofits, these are people who are just as smart as anybody else, just as capable of driving value, but they take 5, 10, 20% pay cuts to do something that is subjectively more valuable. No one goes into a nonprofit and saying, I'm going to get rich. They say, I'm going to go into a nonprofit to save the whales, save the ocean, save the, the earth, save the peanut, whatever. You do a thing for a thing, and that's subjectively proven. Mm -hmm. So if you are terrified because you're like, I can't pay what company X, Y, and Z pays, and by the way, not everybody, or not every company could be the highest paying company, and by the way, that's a race to the wrong direction. Just putting that out there. Anyway, no, totally. if you can't fight there, you have to fight subjectives, which means you have to fight in terms that are much harder to fight on, but if you can prove it, which means 10 times as much work, 10 times as much proof, proof to a microculture, be specific, be concrete, make it real, then... You can attract people who get what you're about. And by the way, the salary is just this thing you talk about at the very end of the process. That's yep. what we should be focusing on. You want to attract the right people, 
know what you offer on a subjective level and then prove it. And I don't mean claim it and state it and, uh, oh yeah, here's a little bit of proof. I mean, like button that thing down. Otherwise you're just yeah. blah, 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 blah. And it's not easy. And that's why talent play, talent um, within employer branding uh, exists. And they're so, they're so important to, uh, to talent teams to yeah. have that conversation early in the piece to push people so much further down the funnel. Um, I'm really interested in, in this because it is a bit of a hot topic. Uh, if you would be recommending a new EB function to your organization uh, to assist in growth, who do you recommend employer brand report into? We've got we've got a couple of characters. We've got TA, we've got comms, we've no. got marketing. This is this, this is you put two TA or two EV people in a room, and this is the first thing they're going to talk about, guaranteed, right? This is where should where do you think well, it's like it's well, the conversation? Interested to know your opinion. Yeah. So uh, the, you know the overall structure is seventy percent of companies roughly ballpark report them into into TA. Twenty yeah. percent of companies report them into marketing. 10% of companies report them into comms, and there's a handful of people floating around in inter other interesting random places, it seems. That's the structure. My belief is that there is no right answer. I think what matters is the person in the role. And I think because employer brand is there to reflect and connect with every piece of the business, and that means the product, customer service, leadership, advertising, marketing, what, what recruiters say, what marketers say, what salespeople say, there isn't a piece of the business that doesn't support or screw up the employer brand of the company. So a good employer brander is trying to effectively find like, I think of them as visas into different teams. If I'm a recruiter person, I already have a passport for a TA. They get what I do. I'm a native speaker. I understand the language. I understand the, the, the codes. They get, they believe me when I say stuff, we're good to go. There's no work to be done, but marketing mm. thinks I'm some idiot. They think I'm just some kind of fly by night. You don't know anything about marketing. You don't know. You're just a recruiter. And so you have to work two, three, four times as hard to get the visa into marketing to say, let me prove myself. Let me show you how this helps. Let me show you what I need and I can be trusted. So if you're in recruiting and you've always been in recruiting, your next job should report to marketing because you've got the passport to TA already. Now you've got yeah, an instant visa to marketing. And if the goal yeah. is to get as many visas as possible, it's kind of a shortcut to say, how do I create as many networks as humanly possible? Mm. And if you're reporting into marketing, what do you think uh, the benefits of, of reporting into marketing is for an employee branding person? It, 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 it's, if you report to TA, as opposed to TA. Yeah, if you're reporting to TA, all your metrics are TA metrics, which isn't bad. It just is kind of small ball. It's kind of like, a, hey, look, mm. you've reduced the time to fill. Great. But there's so much more to be done. There's so much bigger impact that you could make. If you're reporting mm. into marketing, you get the opportunity, and this is a harder game to play, but just infinitely more valuable if, if you can succeed. And that is you get to own the human face of the brand. Your, fa your brand makes widgets. Your brand sells services that do X and Y and Z, chances are maybe your CEO is famous, maybe your spokesperson is famous, and nobody knows anything about the people in that company. I think about, you know, the last three or four years, every time a company gets into PR trouble, right, their, their boss says something fairly racist, they open too many accounts for their customers accidentally, uh -huh. um, you know, it's a crisis, like this, the, the stock's going to tank, everybody's going to quit. The first thing you do is wheel out the frontline staff. Hey, you're a pizza company and your CEO just said something racist. Meet the person who owns your local franchise. Meet the person who makes your pizza. Meet the person who delivers your pizza. That is the human face of your brand, which, by the way, is called your employer brand. That is what that is. And you can kind of shunt the, the CEO away and say, look at the wonderful people making your pizza. And that's, honestly, the employer brand is functionally the, the, the PR crisis move, go-to move of the last five years. Whether they've called that or not, that's what it's been. So if that's a great example of saying you are the human face and how you make it, you're making this widget and it's going, it's going great, but wouldn't it be better if people felt an emotional connection to the people making that widget? And the answer, by the way, is yes. Yes, it is. They should love that. They should want that. Your marketers who are focused on product and focused on that widget may not have thought, I wish we could talk about the people, or they don't have the time or the bandwidth to kind of focus on the people. And there you are to introduce them to all the people and kind of manage that and kind of say, look, let's show, let me show you how we can help each other, how a rising mm. product profile or a rising stock price supports the employer brand, but the human face yeah. of the brand supports the product and consumer sales and investor relations and, 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 and. 
That is what I refer to as a one brand strategy. It is there's simply one brand and every team looks through that brand to their audience. You know, you look at like a Delta and they look at the same Delta to talk to their employees, to talk to their candidates, to talk to their uh, customers, to talk to their investors. It's one brand. And that is a really hard thing to do. That is kind of like the platonic ideal of what employer brand can be. You've got to get there. It takes a while to get there, trust me. They're an incredible ally. Yeah, but at the same time, it's it's just they're so cohesive in their messaging. You look at any message that they put out there, whether it's on a jetway or a commercial, it could be an employer brand ad or a commercial ad or a consumer ad or an investor relation ad just as easily as any of the others. They're, it's, but it's the same ad. That is cohesion. Yeah, That's it. a one-brand strategy. Yeah. You mentioned uh, being willed out, employer branding willed out when uh, that you're in crisis mode. You know, like to think that's uh, that's not the case uh, in these days, but maybe it is given the the shortage in the market. Yeah. If you were if you were advising uh, a, a hyper growth company, um, you know there there are many of them do, that are doing quite well and and looking for lots of people, and and they've got a, a team of employer branding people. Can you can you share a, a type of ratio you might, they they should be having in terms of P, uh, employee branding stuff? Say they're reporting into TA. Mm -hmm. Say there's you know is it a one in ten for every every ten talent acquisition people? There's there's at least one employee branding person. I, I don't how know. Do you, how do teams scale and, and think about uh, growth and? Yeah, it's tough. I, th I think it, it, you can't make a, a layer ratio and say this is what it should be because I think there's a maturity model to what employer brand function does. Like in, employer brand function starts usually as a pilot project. Like we've been recruiting hand to mouth for so long, we, you know, the natural inclination is to say, gosh, I wish we could tell a story cohesively about the people working here. But I'm a recruiter. I'm too busy kind of running around sourcing candidates to make that happen. You start a project, you do a video, you do some interviews, maybe you decide Glassdoor is your campaign or whatever that, you start a pilot project. And once you have the pilot project, you go, cool, it worked. I proved it. Can we get a little more resources, please? Can I, you know, you're Oliver or something, please, sir, can I have some resources? And they give you a little bit of resource and maybe they designate you a full-time employer brand or in your job. So, okay, how do we create a basic structure that allows me to make some impact with 10 recruiters or 100 recruiters? And frankly, I've seen both. I've actually worked in places where there was a 10 to 1 and another place there was a 101 ratio, and it can work. Then the question becomes, how do you grow that team out to start saying, what are the specific, specific talents that you need, whether it's writing or videography or social media or design or what are those things? And you start to kind of buttress the idea, the strategy with skill sets. And then after that is that kind of one brand strategy where you aren't off on your own building and maintaining an employer brand. You're managing the employer brand piece of a larger brand, which means more shared resources, more shared understanding. You help them, they help you, that sort of thing. So in each one of those stages, the ratios have definite bands in terms of what they could potentially be. So I don't want to kind of stick to there is an answer. It's a 10 to one because, but I'll, I'll really, all I think is you have to have somebody who's there to be the employer brand person. You have to be, and whether it's, you've got 10 recruiters or a hundred, that one employer brander, if they're doing the job right, should make every recruiter that much better, right? Whether it's 5% or 10% better, just the math says, yeah, you definitely need the help. Well so what's that one metric that an employer branding or two metrics that employer branding should be looking out for to prove to the business that there's additional resources that's needed in the yeah. team because you're moving the needle. Yeah, you really are. And again, it goes back to that maturity model. And if you're starting with just kind of a pilot or you're just one person, chances are your metrics are very channel driven, right? If you're on social media, what are your follower counts? What are you, how much engagement are you seeing? There's not a big strategic number you're able to do because you're kind of nibbling around the edges. You're just supporting recruiting and making recruiters, recruiters life a little better. So when you get to that middle section where you're like, oh, there's some ownership, there's some drive, you can start to shape some of, or at least influence the talent strategy. That's when to me, time to fill is like the ultimate litmus test of, are you driving value at the smallest possible rate? If you are attracting people and keeping sourcers from having to beg people to apply, your impact is clear. 
It's just the beginning of your impact, but it's clear right there. And that's really where you can start to use that as a lever to start to ask for more resources to get really, really deep. Um, there's a lot of metrics that get applied to employer brand to different levels. I personally say anything that looks like numbers of applicants is a bad metric. Because again, you're not looking for more, you're looking for better. And I think more really muddies the water. That So top of funnel is not always the best metric. It's really about... When you need a person, is a person ready to go, or do you have to go hunt them? Can you farm them, or can you hunt them? And that shift, I mean, it's evolutionary. That took thousands and thousands mm. and thousands of years of those humans to do. It's going to take your company a while to do it, but just that shift means it works. I mean, for example, you have 10 recruiters. Not, you don't have to do 10 recruiters. You have a recruiter, and one out of 10 of those requisitions your recruiter goes, oh, you want someone who go blah, 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 blah. You know what? I got two people in my pocket. Would you like to talk to them right now? That mm. having kind of built that reputation, having those nurtured leads, that pipeline ready to go, even one in 10 recs done that way is a 10% reduction in time to fill, which any TA leader would dance on, you know, on a, you know, whatever to celebrate because that's a huge move. But that is the kind of changes you could be making. Yeah, nice. All right, we're in season two of Talent Blazers, and um, the season, episode 23, this one, um, a lot of people uh, who listen to this, uh, watch this, are, uh, love video. You'd love to get your thoughts on uh, the, the topic of, of video. What, what does the role of video, how does that play into employer branding? You know, it's funny. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help myself. Are you ready? I hate Go video. On. I hate video. <laughs> video makes me crazy. Like I think of when I think about the internet or I think about information, I go, what's the fastest way to get information to me? It's not video, it's text. And so I kind of lean towards text. And the universe has kind of had to beat me about the head and shoulders to say, no, James, you're being a stick in the mud. There's so much more in video. And I've finally been a, become, a, become a convert over the last three years that video works. It can be done. It doesn't have to be insanely Welcome. expensive. <laughs> I know. I know. I feel like I should, you know, I should shut up about that. But it's like, no, it's true. It took me a while to get there. To me, it's about speed of knowledge transfer and speed of knowledge finding. And video is not really suited for that. It's for storytelling. It's for flavor. It's for the nuances and showing you things that I can make choices in a text document about what words I use that I can't make choices when you see the people walking behind me when I'm talking in my company, right? There's so much, you know, kind of ancillary knowledge that happens. Um, but my, my feeling on video is that for the most part, we've learned bad lessons from social media video. And those lessons are things like 30 seconds is plenty. Thank you. And I'm like, 30 seconds, I mean, the TikTokification of the world. It's like, wh what? A job is a life-changing event, and you're going to get yeah. me interested in 30 seconds? Think again, my friend. Think again. Would you buy a house based on 30-second video? Of course not. But that's the kind of life-changing conversation you're having. So to me, if you're doing video, it's not about how snackable can you be. It's about have the meal. Have a five minute video that spells it out. I had a conversation with someone in a very big social media channel who's every recruiter is connected to. That's all I'm going to say about that. And they said, you know, James, your videos are way too long. And I said, here's the deal. I get that you think it should be shorter because you think most videos are boring. And if you're boring, being more is bad. Okay, so you shrink it. But if you can say something meaningful or show something meaningful, Go as long as you want to go. And in fact... I absolutely agree with you, James. And I, uh, not many people have this opinion. It's yeah, music to I, my ears. Trust because me, I feel like I'm the only one shouting in the, in the forest No, here. no, no. I'm, I'm with you and I look at a lot of video. If it's interesting, you always will watch it and, and, um, and be engaged. And, and you, you don't know. want the person who's only going to invest 30 seconds of their attention in what you have to say. You want to talk to the person who got through all five minutes because they mm. are bought in. They want to know more. They are interested. This isn't a passing fancy. Yeah. They're not just randomly hitting the button that happens to be apply. They are in. They're interested. Yeah, yeah. And that's I, who you should I be talking to. You. Yeah. Look, the social media platforms that most people put, uh, enterprise, it's LinkedIn, TikTok's emerging. Yep. Like, it's such a crowded and, uh, and a crowded space with mm -hmm. lots of logos and distractions. Of course, people want to catch your attention quickly. It is bite size. Yep. I totally agree. But yep. 
you know, where, where's the meat on the bone? Exactly. Where can people really buy into the story, the the the, uh, the brand, and, and be around? I I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, and on the that. other side, you know, you've seen the TikTok. You know, hey, we're going to do TikTok resumes. I'm like, is there a recruiter in the universe who says? Yes. What I want to do is spend two whole minutes looking at your face, trying to decide, please let me swipe away. Please let me swipe away. Like I can, I can see in six seconds that you're not a good fit on a resume. Boom, done. Six, boom, boom. Done. They can fly through applications. You're going to make me sit through an entire video. Oh God, no, there's n nobody wants this. This is a, a yeah. weird end around a problem that doesn't even exist. It's crazy. Yeah. Man. It would be, it'd be fascinating to see how that one plays out. Yeah. It's uh, if people are talking about it. Uh, look, you just mentioned a couple of challenges that uh, that that video has faced in the past, and, and one we were sort of thinking might be in the future with TikTok. What do you think are the challenges for employer branding people to introduce video into their workflow? Yeah, uh, just a couple. Yeah. Look, I'm I'm a I'm a, a MacGyver. Get your hands dirty and figure it out for yourself. I mean, I, I learned to code yeah. a long time ago. You know, it's HTML, so it's not real code, but it's enough, right? It's it's no one's asking me for Python advice. I assure you. Um, but I'm a believer that if you're going to do it, figure out how to do it. I don't want to farm it out. I don't want to hand other people my brand. That's crazy. Yeah. I want to understand it. And so, to me, the curve of learning video has been hard, but incredibly rewarding. And that means starting with just a rinky dink old eye video and eye movie video, you got a camera, take a quick conversation, figure out how to chop it up. So it's as tight as it can be without being too tight. And then there's so many easy tools to kind of lay in a little bit of music, to lay in a card an end card enroll, just something very simple. The nice thing about video is that being rough and ready, it's not a bad thing. It's bad if you're in Hollywood. It's bad if you're Target. If you're bad, if you're you know trying to sell really it plays sexy. on the authenticity piece. Exactly. It? It's exactly. not a Steven Spielberg movie. <laughs> yeah, like my first videos were literally a recorded Zoom conversation at 480p, which is like this is the thinnest. Oh, it's horrible. The audio was not great, but I got more visits to that and more views yeah. of that than I did anything else I did because I was telling a story that was very behind the scenes that normally you wouldn't get to see and people went, I wanna know more. And that's what it's about. You're not spinning this tap dancing, all singing, all dancing kind of situation. You're telling people, this is what it's like. You don't have to believe me, ask the person who works here. That is video. And honestly, it's been really fascinating to me because my current situation, I tried to write interviews and our culture said, polish the language. And I'm like, I like it rough and raw. I like their kind of ums. I like the the thing in the middle, they kind of they have half a sentence and they kind of veer off and you're like, oh, they never came back and finished that thought. But it's still true, but written down, it looks weird. It looks broken on video. It makes so much sense. And it's very hard for the, you know, you know, someone to say, can you remove that word and change it to that other word? No, because that's what they said. And it kind of yeah. locks you in this spot that says, look, if you're trying to be authentic, the universe may try very hard to make you more polished. Video is actually, weirdly, a chance to be more authentic because you can't like airbrush hair onto my picture. You can't suddenly kind of, you know, put words in my mouth and say, I think, you know, blah, blah, whatever. You can't do it. It is what it is. And mm. that's what it is. Mm. You can trim and you can edit, but that's all it can be. And so video is kind of forces internally you to kind of nudge leadership and say, it is what it is. This is what they said. Now yeah. for me, doing videos and recording videos means I'm also capturing the language. I'm capturing what they're saying. You do 50 videos, run a text, uh, run them through like Otter or some sort of automated transcription service, throw it all into a word cloud. Guess what your brand is? It's that. You said it. It's the words they repeated. It's the ideas that keep coming up over and over and over again. And that word cloud is like a, a stick. You can beat anybody in leadership up with it. They said this. This is this isn't me. This is what they said. It's an incredibly powerful tool. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing your your, uh, your thoughts on video. And thanks for joining us on Talent Blazer, James. Oh, I'm so glad you uh, asked me. It's been a fascinating come. conversation. Fantastic. Yeah, this has been great. Well, have a great day. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everybody.